Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is now episode number 651 by my count. My name is Camden Busey. I'm here in Grays Lake, Illinois. We have a really exciting uh, discussion lined up for you today. Let me introduce to you first our good friend, co-founder of Reform Forum here, and pastor very soon to be uh, installed at... Uh, at Faith OPC in Fawn Grove, Pennsylvania, at least by our time in episode time, which is not when this will come out, at least recording <laughs> time, uh, will be installed on Friday. Jeff Waddington, good to see you, Jeff. How are you doing? Oh, it's great to be here, brother. Yeah. Thank you for the privilege. Well, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to, to speak with you. We always love having you on the program. And this one's really right up your alley. Uh, today, we're welcoming to the program for the very first time, uh, Dr. William Redinger, uh, who is the Associate Professor for Government History and Criminal Justice at uh, Regent University, and uh, a Reformed person at that. Uh, he's a, a member of Reformation Presbyterian Church in Virginia Beach, uh, nearby to the university, and we're welcoming him to the program for the first time for a very important subject. Welcome to the program, Bill. It's good to see you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be with you today. Yeah, we're delighted to have you with us, and uh, maybe not because of the circumstances, but uh, certainly you can help us understand from an historical perspective, and uh, not just in, in vague history, but one also informed by uh, you know our re- Reformed tradition and uh, biblical truth. We're going to be speaking about an article uh, that Dr. Redinger uh, published uh, in the American Political Thought Journal back in summer 2016. That's uh, published by the uh, University of Chicago, very prestigious uh, institution. It's kind of like Chicago's Ivy League, uh, a very, very significant uh, university. In this journal, uh, back in summer 2016, you can get this article online. It's I think it's about 20 bucks or some, something therein. Uh, is titled The American Revolution, Romans 13, and the Anglo Tradition of Reformed Protestant Resistance Theory. You can see I've printed out my PDF copy. We're going to be talking <laughs> about that today. And certainly, um, you know, now given the, the fact that we're in the throes of a pandemic and there has been various questions about uh, constitutional authority and uh, whether or not various governors in various states, Illinois is one of them, uh, are, are overstretching or overreaching with their, their authority. What is the responsibility of Christians in, in such a scenario? But also, as we record, it's June 1st, and I know this episode might be out a week or two after that. Uh, certainly, we're also in the throes of uh, very concerning uh, riots and there are many uh, violence and injustice in our country. And there's a, a lot going on, a lot to be concerned about, and uh, we need the Lord's mercy in, in many regards, but we're going to be considering uh, the nature of uh, civil authority and the magistrate as it re- pertains to the church and consider uh, the, the matter as it, as it uh, came to the fore with the American Revolution. So there's a lot to discuss, but uh, just very briefly I'd like to uh, mention that you can uh, check out what we're up to at reformedforum.org. I've got a contact page there. If you'd like to get a hold of us with any comments or suggestions, you can uh, click on that top left of the page. There's a little uh, envelope thing where you can uh, send us a note. But uh, I have also want to draw people's attention not only to the recent episodes that we've been uh, able to produce, uh, but also some uh, online courses. So we're, we're developing and working on uh, an educational platform. And uh, you can visit that, uh, the section on the menu called Academy. And then therein you can find some free online courses. You can register for them. And, and please give us your feedback. Uh, it's, it's in the works, but uh, we've made these available and we have other courses lined up that will be uh, coming out soon and other programs of study. Uh, so we're really excited about what's going on at Reformed Forum. But uh, if you'd like uh, to take part in that, uh, and certainly well, let us know how the experience has gone and how, how we can improve it, uh, please send us a note. We'd love to hear from you. So, Jeff, I want to first uh, start off with you just to, to, to speak perhaps about your fascination and interest in, in American history and in politics. I know you've done some work in that regard and, and love to interface these with our Reformed tradition. What were your thoughts, uh, you know, when we when we were presented with this, uh, with this idea that we might be able to talk about this article? Well, of course, just in general, the idea of, of how to properly handle Romans 13 uh, was of interest to me. I'm preaching once for the second time through Romans at Faith OBC in Fallen Grove. So eventually I'm going to get to this chapter and it can be dicey uh, even when handled properly uh, with regard to the Christian's submission to the magistrate. So that that's 
there, but also my, my own family background. Uh, as m many of you may know, uh, my sixth great grandfather, uh, Robert Morris, was the uh, superintendent of finance for the Continental Congress. He was the president before the office of president was created. Now, as it turns out, um, philosophically, politically, financially, I'm probably in great disagreement because my, my great, 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 great grandfather was for a central bank and he was for, he was a federalist as over against an anti-federalist. And, you know, we may get into some of that in our conversation, mm -hmm. but, but uh, so, well, uh, so anyway, so there's that family background that I just love, but I also love history in general, American history in particular, although I'm working, I've been trying to build my library to include histories of every part of the world, uh, China and India being of two in interests to me at present, but always American history. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. I know we have conversations about various things and uh, as stuff comes up in the news, it's always uh, useful and insightful to, to review our history. It's part of the, the important function of being well-read in history and understanding even the very nature and the, the foundations of our of our country to be able to understand how to interface with things presently. So here, um, Bill, it's it's fascinating that this article came up. I was at a ministerium meeting, so we monthly have a, min, a, a meeting of ministers in the Presbytery of the Midwest. We often meet at Wheaton. We know you spent a year there uh, teaching at Wheaton College. Uh, we meet at the OPC there on uh, Naperville Road, and I was talking to uh, a bunch of people, but one of them was uh, Pastor Jim Meckelson, who's pastor of our OPC church in Elburn, Illinois, and he just, we were having conversations about what our churches are going to be doing in the midst of this pandemic, and at the time, our governor had not clarified or, or res restricted in, or released any restrictions on churches, and in fact, churches were more restricted in, in how they might interact than a lot of stores were, you know, I went over to Bass Pro Shops and, you know, was able to just go buy stuff for a hunting trip, <laughs> uh, you know, unrestricted, but churches are only allowed to have 10 people regardless of the size of their building. So anyway, I mean, that was something up in the air recently. The U the Illinois Supreme Court has forced uh, the governor of Illinois to clarify himself and basically turned all of his restrictions into, into recommendations, but that's another matter. So the question at, at the fore was how do we respond as as uh, faithful and obedient Christians in the face of, um, you know, civil authority that depending on your perspective and, and depending on your estimation, I don't, I don't mean to make value judgments here, but it's an issue. We have to wonder whether or not, you know, it's wise to be civilly disobedient if ever that's uh, uh, called for or allowable you know, in, in one way, shape or form. So before we get in, uh, anyway, my point is he recommended this article to me and I'd never heard of it. And I was so happy. I got right on during our conversation and bought the article and, uh, read it that day and then promptly emailed you to, so that we could have this conversation <laughs> right now. Bill, I'd be curious just to, to have you just explain a bit of your work at Regent. And I'm looking at the list of courses you've taught, and I'd, I'd like to uh, take all of them. So could you email me your lectures <laughs> soon? Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I uh, For 10 years or so, I've been at Regent uh, where I teach political theory, I'm broadly trained in the history of political philosophy. And I have a particular interest in American political thought and American politics. Um, this has been a, uh, a topic, uh, uh, the American Revolution, this has been a topic of interest to, my, uh, to myself for a very long time. Uh, and since we're talking about family backgrounds, uh, I cannot trace my lineage back to one of the great founders, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but several great, great, greats ago, uh, one of my ancestors was uh, in, in, in the infantry uh, and he uh, immigrated from uh, southern Germany or uh, German-speaking Switzerland, uh, Hanover in those days, and uh, and so I am a, I am descended from a veteran, and so I have a, a certain measure of of cognitive dissonance going on here. Uh, very proud of that heritage. At the same time, that uh, perhaps like you, Jeff, I'm not sure that uh, I would have entirely agreed with everything that uh, Heinrich Redinger thought uh, back in the 18th century. So. Uh, uh, one of the things that I thought that I might just comment on briefly is that, uh, Camden, you just, you use the word wisdom. How do we, how do we apply various biblical principles 
uh, with wisdom. And I think that's particularly important uh, in thinking about politics, uh, keeping in mind that uh, first and foremost, the Bible is, of course, not a textbook about politics. Right. So any wholesale importation of particular principles without consideration of prudence and wisdom uh, is, uh, I think, not advisable. So, uh, but I continue to be interested in the, the topic of resistance to uh, to tyranny, whether this is ever justifiable. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, it seems to be relevant, uh, perhaps most relevant uh, in the case of the church, for example, in China. And so uh, uh, you may have seen on the Internet, uh, Pastor Wang Yi, uh, prior to his incarceration, uh, released a statement with the expectation that he probably would be incarcerated. Uh, and I would recommend uh, uh, everyone who is watching this perhaps to take some time to read that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember the title, uh, something like a declaration of obedience or mm. uh, disobedience or something to that effect. Uh, but the, you know, the, the general theme there of Pastor Yee's article is uh, we need to keep our eyes on eternal things, and it's very hard to do, uh, but we belong to a kingdom not of this world. Uh, the, the government of, of communist China is a tyranny, and, uh, and yet nevertheless, uh, my, my role here is not uh, as a pastor, my role here is not to uh, quite so much transform culture, although the church will do that. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, my purpose here is to preach the gospel. And uh, and if you read that, I think what you see there is some some very very clear parallels to Calvin, whom he named from the document, uh, and also, uh, I mean, in particular, uh, Calvin's Institutes and. Important parallels. I don't know if this was intended, but important parallels to uh, uh, you know Calvin's many letters to the to the pr French Protestants in the late 1550s and early 1560s. And so, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I'm thinking about right now uh, in recent days is uh, places where much more so than in America, there's a very practical question. Yeah. Now, I think I was I was most struck reading. Your article and uh, thinking about this not just in an isolated, you know, history. This isn't just a question of, of historical theology, but obviously it has an import for the present day. But there's there's quite a few different views on what was going on in the American Revolution. And uh, right here in your article, just to start off with the abstract. You note that some uh, scholars argue that the theology of the American Revolution was fundamentally Lockean, that is uh, John Locke, but then others present and, and say, no, it wasn't fundamentally Lockean, it was Lockean and Reformed. And then there's a question of whether Locke can be harmonized with Reformed views. And then you present the idea that, no, that there's we need to go even further with some um, more uh, investigation to see the the different threads of of uh, reformed thought, whether Anglo or continental, and how those those compare. So that's the basic structure, at least as I've understood your article and in the way that it approaches. So I'm very excited to talk about the different layers here of understanding and uh, how that might inform us. How were you presented with this with this notion? I mean, sometimes the stories of these articles are interesting, but um, how did you arrive at, at this study? Did it did you uh, go out searching for it? Did it find you in some way? Well, I think it's probably true to say that it found me. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I went. Uh, I was a student many years ago at Grove City College, and when I was there, uh, you know, I began to dig around and, and find what some of these these names that I was hearing in the classroom had to say. Uh, about questions of resistance and government. Uh, and so uh, really ever since then, I began to become more interested in it. Uh, uh, you know, over time, I guess I would say that my, my trajectory was that uh, I began to see more and more clearly that there, there's probably uh, some serious tension between claims that were being made by uh, clearly John Locke, uh, but, but also by uh, Orthodox ministers during the 18th century in America on the one hand, and what I was reading in Calvin and others like him. So uh, that's really something that, uh, you know, not necessarily in this form, but it's something that, uh, you know, had been in my mind uh, for quite a while. And so it became pretty apparent uh, just reading uh, what uh, people like Calvin and others had to say about these texts in the Bible, 
that uh, there's probably at least some problems uh, with with the way in which these texts were handled during mm -hmm. the revolutionary period. Um, you know, for, for those listening, just a, I think a very basic statement of the uh, the thesis uh, that I present in this article is that uh, the American Revolution was influenced by reformed Protestants, but perhaps not the most consistent of reformed Protestants. Uh, perhaps people who at times had uh, been influenced by the political thinking of the age, which of course is a as a regular temptation for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and furthermore, there's there's another tradition. Uh, you mentioned, Camden, my language of uh, uh, continental tradition. Uh, mostly people on the continent who uh, in the 16th, 17th century were very, very cautious about uh, what it meant to to open up uh, what I would regard as a can of worms. When you, you know, when you, when you get violence out of the can, it's hard to get it back in. And so, uh, you know, that is the prudential side of uh, of biblical arguments that were made that um, you know we're, it's not actually okay necessarily to do what what eventually uh, was recommended for example by the declaration of independence so, so the question we're looking at is uh, christians who are living under under tyranny um, what is their obligation in terms of uh, submission to the magistrate, political authorities? And is there a situation in which uh, Christians can or must uh, perform civil disobedience? Uh, and of course, that's the broader question. And then we wanna look at, okay, what did the reform tradition and then John Locke say uh, and did they emerge at some points? And, and then we want to look at how did they handle what Paul the Apostle said in Romans 13? Because that's the key thing, right? Is did they handle that text properly? Now, you have an answer, and I know the answer that you've given, but we want to lay this out. The historical setting for what is sometimes referred to as re Reformed Resistance Theory or theology goes back to the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France, uh, or at least that appears to have been post-Calvin, the context in which uh, you begin to see a specific uh, school of resistance theory within the reformed uh, world. Uh, so let, let's, uh, that's the, that's the in, uh, initial historical context for this whole idea of wrestling with the question of obedience to tyranny. Perhaps this is the question. Maybe you can, for, for those of us who are not schooled in political theory, explain what resistance theory is and, yes. and how that comes into play in, in the American Revolution specifically. For anyone who believes in any kind of uh, uh, natural justice, any kind of right and wrong, uh, there's always a distinction between legitimate government and, and illegitimate government or between good government and tyrannical governments. Uh, so the question becomes uh, uh, whether, whether, there, whether there's any recourse by the common man uh, in cases of tyrannical or illegitimate government. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, it's a, a bit of an oversimplification, but uh, throughout most of the, the ancient and medieval period, uh, there's a great suspicion uh, of, of the goodness of this. Uh, so, uh, you know, a classic statement to this effect would be Thomas, uh, who, uh, you know, in kingship is very, uh, very clear that uh, that any kind of uh, revolution, uh, which he calls rebellion, uh, is a bad idea uh, for uh, for both principled and prudential reasons. Um, when we move into the modern period, it, it becomes much more of a question. And so. Uh, I guess uh, it, start with Calvin and just mention a few others. Uh, so in the paper, this this group of thinkers that I call continental thinkers because they're mostly on the continent, uh, I would include Calvin with this. And so, uh, you know, I would say uh, this is prior to uh, the, the Bartholomew's Day Massacre where we see this, this kind of thinking. Uh, but the question becomes, uh, uh, Calvin, can we, uh, what can we do uh, what can we do against uh, the French uh, oppression of Protestants? And 
and the short answer is, uh, if there is to be any resistance, uh, it needs to be done by some kind of legitimate public authority. Uh, you know, in Calvin's letters, he speaks of a, a prince of the blood, somebody immediately uh, who had some uh, some legitimate uh, connection to the crown uh, ought to be leading this. Uh, and I don't go into it in the paper, but I would argue that this is simply Calvin being a natural law thinker. Uh, it's the same kind of thing that you see in Thomas Aquinas. Uh, what do you? What is a legitimate war for Thomas? Uh, the first and most important criterion is that it must be done by a public authority. Uh, if it's not done by a public authority, you you simply lose all order. Uh, and, and so you see this kind of thinking being developed, uh, I think, by Calvin. Now. Uh, Post-Calvin, with the rise of uh, significant persecution, uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Philip de Mornay, uh, author of The Vindication Against Tyranny, writes this uh, justification for resistance. And uh, in the paper, uh, I try to show that I think that this, this very influential document is really not a different, it's not a different species than than Calvin's political thought on the question, even though it's much more developed as a legal document. Uh, he's, the author is very clear that resistance specifically by private individuals uh, is, is not permitted. But uh, in, in some kind of capacity, uh, as Calvin argued in the last chapter of the Institutes, uh, there are some magistrates who are legitimate magistrates who have a uh, I know that he uses the word right, but they have a right and a duty to check the power of a licentious prince. And so uh, you see that same thing in Brutus. Uh, and in the paper, I talk about Beza as well. He says the same kind of thing during this period. Uh, uh, Gilbert Burnett is another name that I mentioned just in passing. Uh, Bur Burnett would be uh, someone not on the continent, I might put in the continental tradition, whose, uh, whose writing was uh, very influential as a uh, uh, a justification for the Glorious Revolution. And it was very clear on this as well. Uh, what's happening in the Glorious Revolution of 1688-1689 is not a popular uprising uh, uh, against the king, uh, but instead it's uh, it's an exercise of legitimate public authority against the tyrannical monarch. This was the argument. And so, uh, you know, I find that uh, to be persuasive. Now, uh, what what happens later and this is, uh, you know, a critical question for how we interpret the American Revolution. Uh, but what happens later is that Locke writes his his famous two treatises of government, uh, the most significant uh, document to defend the right of revolution. And uh, the argument, in effect, is that uh, government exists only protect our individual rights. If it doesn't do that, it's not a legitimate government. Therefore, uh, the people can, uh, we would say, revolt. Uh, Locke, strictly speaking, says the people may reestablish a government now that there isn't a legitimate government. Right. Uh, and so uh, the question at that point becomes, for Locke, do we, do we agree with Locke that the common people can pick up the sword for a redress of, or not a redress, but, you know, a, a violent uh, restoring of the kind of government you want, or uh, do we side with Calvin uh, and this continental tradition? Uh, for a majority of the people in America in the late 18th century, the answer was we side with Calvin and that this is, this is consistent with our reform convictions. Uh, what, I, what I suggest in the paper is that it's actually not that consistent with your reform convictions <laughs> and that some of these, <laughs> that's rather blunt, uh, but uh, you know, this, this was actually developed over time uh, by by thinkers who were rather obviously not particularly orthodox, uh, and so uh, there was an apparent combination of Locke's political thought with with uh, more orthodox Calvinist political theology. So uh, you also ask the question, uh, you know, what do we? What is the simple answer about what the the Bible says? Uh, might even say a simplified answer, I suppose. But what does the Bible have to say about the question of resistance? Uh, and I, I would think that it's, it's really quite clear, actually, that this is not something that private individuals have the authority to do. Uh, so if there is an illegitimate government, it would seem on the one hand to be 
immoral not to say that it's tyrannical or it's being unjust. But on the other hand, uh, you know, we're told rather clearly to submit. And Calvin makes this argument in the last chapter of the Institutes. So uh, Calvin, interpreting scripture with scripture, uh, looks at Romans 13. Uh, the civil magistrate is, is a minister of God. He's there for your good, not for your evil. Uh, it's rather clear. Now, what the question becomes then, uh, what do we do if it would seem that the government is actually not there for your good? What if you're doing what is good and you're still afraid? Or what if you are doing what is bad and you're not afraid? Uh, well, Calvin's position is that Romans 13, and I think this is a critical point, but Romans 13 seems to describe the powers that are. It's not a prescriptive discussion in Romans 13, but it's a descriptive discussion. Uh, and so he looks at 1 Peter 2, for example, which has parallel language. Uh, and 1 Peter 2 rather uncomfortably uh, points out that that bond servants should be subject even to unjust masters. Uh, and so, the, uh, you know, I would point out that, uh, you know, Jeff, you mentioned that you're, you're preaching through Romans 13. At, at some point, I don't mention it here in the article, but at some point I looked at John Murray's commentary on Romans. And, uh, mm -hmm. and this was, you know, he states this there as well, that uh, Romans 13 is a descriptive rather than a prescriptive discussion of civil magistrates. And so in some sense, at least, according to Calvin, these things uh, that we see in civil government are, uh, they're enacting justice, even though uh, we don't know how exactly, uh, even if they're illegitimate. Now, uh, I think it's rather clear that if, you know, uh, acts, for example, uh, if the civil government tells us to do something which is tantamount to sin, it is sin to obey. But that kind of disobedience is not resistance. That's disobedience. Uh, civil resistance would be more of an organized action, uh, whether by a public authority or a, a private conglomerate of people. Uh, and I think it's also important to distinguish between that kind of disobedience and, and civil disobedience. I mean, I think in its most technical sense, when we use the phrase civil disobedience, uh, what comes to my mind is something more like uh, uh, Thoreau or, or uh, you know, some of Martin Luther King's writing, you know, where he suggests that uh, the purpose of civil disobedience is to go uh, effectively to go out and find laws that are unjust and disobey them with the, with the purpose of social change, uh, which is a little bit different than what, you know, if, if uh, you know, here in Virginia, you know, the governor would say, you know, uh, you may never meet as a church again. Well, that's pretty clear, clear cut. Uh, about what we do at that point. Uh, sure. And the point here is not that uh, I'm trying to change the, I'm not trying to transform Virginia society. I'm trying to worship God. So. Uh, now, uh, Bill, how does, uh, we understand, we can understand that uh, in on the continent, uh, in England also, because the Westminster Assembly is convened in the midst of a civil war between Parliament and the King. And according to uh, Calvin and the the continental tradition, uh, that would that would be involving lesser magistrates as over against what they perceive to be a tyrannical king. Yeah. But but uh, when Paul writes, it's more in, in to the Romans. It's quite likely that, that Nero was the emperor, right? So. Yeah. Uh, you had a tyrannical, well, as far as we know from history, a tyrannical emperor. Uh, and he says that these, are, as you say, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. It's this is the way it is. You have the rulers you have because of God's providence. Yeah. Not right. accidental, right? Not accidental. And yes, there is, there is a standard that, that they ought to meet. And very often leaders don't meet, right? And so we get into some of the, the, the weeds, if you will, when, when you have to wrestle with, okay, uh, if you're just assessing, it's one thing to, to give an assessment or an evaluation, but, but your description of civil disobedience is very, is a much more, uh, new, is much more articulated. There's more detail to it and there's more of a transformation of society element that of course is not involved in the question of the, the apostles in Acts chapter four, uh, 
you you ju yourself judge whether we must obey God rather than men. Right? That that's the the comments that Peter makes before the Sanhedrin. Uh, but we also see that Paul, uh, as a Roman citizen, follows the legal procedure to eventually get himself before Caesar. Right? He appeals to Caesar, right. but he and at one point he even says to the Roman governor when he's still in Caesarea, he says, "If I'm guilty of what I've been accused of, I deserve capital punishment." He he yeah. says that. Uh, so the question in our situation is, um, how does the Republican form of Republican small r, uh, form of government uh, interface with this question? Because, the, because you are in a situation where you don't have a king, first of all, you have an elected official, and then you have governors and you have uh, local magistrates. So you, you have a federal or federated system uh, and you also have checks and balances. So an argument could be made that in the United States, the president is not the, the head, the constitution. It, I mean, that's one argument that some have made. So how does that complicate, you know, or does it complicate the question? Well, uh, I, I would say that it makes the question more difficult. I'm not sure that it's ultimately complicated. Um, a lot going on there, I guess, in that question. So. <laughs> Sorry about no, that. No, no, that's fine. Uh, one, I guess, first of all, with respect to the this uh, situation in the later chapters of Acts, where Paul is appealing to Caesar, uh, you know, I think uh, you know that that clearly is something below uh, civil resistance. Right. Uh, he's using all lawful legal means at his disposal uh, to do what he needs to do as uh, as an apostle. Um, and uh, there's not really disobedience going on there. Uh, he, he's doing everything that he, he may lawfully do. And, and really what comes to mind there is that uh, this great chapter in, in the City of God in Book 19, where Augustine uses the language of using uh, the city of man along our way, um, which, you know, it, it's not exactly a transforming of society kind of language, I guess. So, um, but... Uh, in the American context, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, two, two, two factors about the U.S. government. Uh, one is, of course, state governments and uh, the responsibility that, that governors have to uh, protect the order, the freedom, uh, and, and welfare of their citizens. Uh, and clearly that question has to come to mind in the case of some kind of uh, uh, severe tyranny. Uh, obviously don't like to think about these things, but uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, in the United States, of course, uh, in, you know, most technically we would say that the, the constitution is not the ultimate authority, it's the people behind the constitution. I think that does invite us to ask the question, does that mean that you know, we do have this authority to, to look over uh, the, our magistrates to make sure that they're falling in line? Uh, and that I think is what makes it a little bit more cloudy. So. Uh, let me just let me just suggest this. Uh, in the United States Constitution, uh, there's clearly nothing that affirms a right to revolution. Sure. Uh, so it, there'd be something rather unsettling about the idea of taking clauses about revolution in the Declaration and putting it into the Constitution, which the framers explicitly did not do. Uh, and so uh, that's not to say that uh, obviously they affirmed. Uh, a right to revolution, but uh, that's not to say that the, they thought it would be a good idea to put it in there. Uh, we have a number <laughs> of legal means uh, in the Constitution for the people, uh, something like um, uh, uh, Article Five, uh, giving us, uh, you know, the, the ability to the, to amend the Constitution. Uh, and I'm, you know, at this point, I'm trying to avoid the question of uh, secession or, you know, nullification and so on, but. Uh, I, I do not think that there's necessarily a difference there. Um, that's not to say that I, I don't think the people have any redress. Uh, there's at least some question with respect to the state governments in, in situations of severe emergency or disorder. Um, 
you know, at one point, I think it was you, Jeff, you mentioned uh, just the question of providence. And right. so this is very, very prominent throughout Calvin uh, in Beza's writings on politics uh, that you don't see as much of later. Uh, on the one hand, uh, government is, regardless of what we say about social contract theory or popular sovereignty or what have you, ultimately governments that are there are there uh, because of providence, howsoever mysterious. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, Jesus' important statement for this purpose here, uh, you know, you would have no authority except that were given to you from above right. uh, the pilot. Uh, there's something there suggestive of God really being in charge, you know, not only over the presidents we like, but over the presidents we don't like. Right. And so uh, that also is related to uh, the question of redress. Uh, you know, the, the natural response to someone like uh, a Calvin would be, uh, this is defeatist. Are you really going to tell people who are, who are suffering that they don't have redress? And I think the answer would be, he's not telling them that. Uh, uh, again, uh, this idea of lesser public magistrates is there. Uh, the idea of God's providence is also very prominent. Uh, whensoever he pleases, uh, God can strike down the king. Uh, whensoever he pleases, uh, he, he can do this. And uh, we ought to be praying people. Uh, and so I don't know that that's what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But, but it's, uh, but it's I, I think, an important truth. Uh, now, there's also something else that I don't want to hear that is also part of all of Calvin's discussions uh, and, and others uh, like him, namely uh, the fact that we're pilgrims here. Right. Uh, the, an eternal perspective changes a lot of this discussion. Mm. And so the, the uh, let's say it's book three in his discussion on the Christian life in the institutes when calvin is discussing the you know the the benefit that should be had from contemplating the next life or something to that effect i don't remember the exact title of that section um but you know that's that's mature christianity and i'm, I'm trying to work my way up there uh, to book three <laughs> sure um, but i think that that's you know part of the answer here as well so, so what what happens okay in in this whole historical unfolding uh, from the Middle Ages through the Reformation. And I think we all understand how this question arises in the face of the Reformation because the magisterial Reformation as such depends upon uh, the reaction and or the goodwill of certain political leaders. We, th we think of Frederick the, the Wise, who was the protector as well as the elector of Martin Luther uh, though that or uh, Calvin is he while he's not a citizen for much of his time in Geneva, his being in Geneva gives him a certain amount of protection, I suppose, from the city fathers, uh, the council. Yeah. Um, there was a point to this. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, <laughs> it went right out of my head. So the historical. So where does the? Okay, we see Calvin arguing for a, what we might call a chastened uh, lesser magistrate uh, view of how to deal with a tyrannical ruler. But then we find, uh, then there's John Locke, and there have been arguments made that Locke is simply secularizing what was a uh, yep. position in, in reformed thinking resistance theory. And and maybe you can speak to that. Is is that a, a a a fair assessment of Locke, or is that a itself a um, inaccurate uh, assessment? Yeah. So uh, as you say, uh, stated earlier, you know, in the paper, I try to summarize some of the debate on this by distinguishing between a, a Lockean view of the history and a, and a Lockean reformed view. So uh, in the Lockean view, the the ministers and political actors who influenced the American Revolution were influenced by Locke. And they may have been Christians as well, but they were incoherent in combining those, those elements. Uh, uh, according to the Lockean view, which I think you were just stating, right. uh, the John Locke's political philosophy, late 17th century, is a, it's a somewhat secular, natural extension of earlier Protestant 
political resistance theory. And, uh, and I would say that that is uh, a partial truth. Uh, he clearly was uh, following on the heels of some others who were, uh, who I think we could safely say were reformed Protestants. Uh, uh, I, I discussed Knox, for example. Uh, you know, you can talk about the orthodoxy uh, or heterodoxy of Milton in that group uh, and, and others. Uh, but what, what I think is really significant is that we see in Locke uh, a tendency uh, to be influenced by people who are probably, uh, for the most part, not that orthodox in their Christianity. Uh, and so it's not really that we can say, yes, Locke was, uh, uh, he wasn't a, an orthodox Christian, but his ideas were basically consistent with Christianity as we, we sometimes hear. Um, and I'm not sure that it's quite that simple. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, two, <clears throat> the two elements uh, uh, that distinguish what I call the Anglo tradition, people like Locke, and Knox and others, and the continental tradition are on the one hand, uh, the continental tradition, Calvin and others, they, they want to say that private individuals have no uh, authority, no license uh, to, uh, to resist the tyranny. Secondly, uh, there's a different handling of the scriptures that gets them to that point. Right. So uh, for Calvin at all, there's, a, there's an emphasis on uh, not getting rid of your mind, but, the, uh, but we need to make sure that we interpret scripture with scripture. Uh, what do the scriptures tell us about parts of scripture that are unclear or uh, maybe that we don't like very much? Uh, and, and by doing that, the conclusion uh, that Calvin arrives at is private individuals may not start wars. Uh, now, for someone like uh, Locke, uh, the statement is rather clear. Uh, ultimately, what happens here is that scripture is interpreted with scripture. Uh, excuse me, uh, scripture is interpreted with reason, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, not particularly uh, affected by scripture. So, uh, uh, in the paper, I try to make a discussion of uh, Romans 13 as it relates to uh, Locke and others like him, uh, with a particular emphasis once again being on uh, verse 4 of Romans 13. Uh, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Uh, so the question that Locke tries to get at and those like him uh, is this once again if if the if the civil magistrate is not actually god's servant for your good but you're doing good and you're still afraid well then romans 13 doesn't actually talk about the situation you're in you don't have to obey your governor uh in that case and so once again we get it back into that question of description versus prescription in this passage so uh, a couple of just important lines from different works of Locke's political thought is, uh, on the one hand, uh, Locke wrote a commentary in the Pauline epistles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he interprets this passage as meaning the following. Uh, it's actually his language, God's servant only for your good. And then if you look at a footnote in the same page, he'll explain that basically means that, for example, if this is a government under the authority of Nero, well, then it's not actually a government. Romans 13 doesn't talk about it. Now, later ministers, uh, Jonathan Mayhew is discussed in the paper. Uh, some ministers uh, try to explicitly say, actually, Romans was not written when Nero was emperor. Uh, I'm not really sure what evidence there is for that. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, clearly this is a problem. So uh, now, uh, the idea here is that we're going to use reason. Uh, another passage from Locke's corpus that I think is revealing is, you know, that he, he, he has a lot of good nuggets in his first treatise, which almost no one reads, uh, because why would you really? Uh, it's not as influential and so on. But uh, there's a line in there where he says that reason is our only star and compass. A very, very clear statement. Right? This is not, a, uh, not somebody you're going to bring in for, uh, you know, children's Sunday school. So... <laughs> Uh, you know, we're going to use reason uh, to interpret the Bible uh, as the ultimate authority. And I think you probably see something like the same thing in Milton's political thought as well. Uh, uh, I try to show in the paper that uh, this kind of handling of Romans 13 uh, was particularly 
uh, influential through uh, one minister uh, during the uh, the 18th century in America, and that was Jonathan Mayhew, uh, uh, heterodox minister in Boston, yep. uh, uh, known to many. Uh, uh, some people who are uh, regular listeners to the podcast may have on their uh, their shelves uh, a book by PNR called uh, Sermons That Shaped America, and right. Mayhew's sermon is in there, uh, and it did indeed shape America. Uh, so, uh, but in this sermon, uh, you see uh, Mayhew uh, really rehearsing this kind of political thought and interpretation of Romans 13 that you find in Locke, uh, and as you find it in uh, Benjamin Hoadley, who'd be a, a heterodox Anglican uh, who, who influenced him a lot, uh, and Milton as well. Uh, and he comes to the same conclusion, carefully laying out for his listeners, and then the sermon was subsequently printed and disseminated. Uh, but but laying out for them this idea that Romans 13 actually says nothing about tyranny. Hmm. Uh, it, it's only a text that describes legitimate government. And so if Britain, for example, uh, fails to repeal the Stamp Act, then Romans 13 doesn't tell us anything about parliament or the crown. Uh, and then later, of course, uh, this gets picked up. Now, uh, uh, Mayhew's thought uh, was so influential that John Adams once wrote that uh, if you really wanted to understand the American Revolution, uh, you have to read the sermon. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, this uh, created uh, the sentiments of the day. And so it was, to some extent, really Locke's political thought and biblical interpretation as mediated through Mayhew that I think is particularly important. Um, uh, later on, uh, Ezra Stiles, the president of Yale, uh, would remark that uh, you know the the biblical commentary of Locke was exceedingly high with the with uh, with the general public uh, because of the influence of ministers and and you know dissemination of these important. Well, that's an extremely, yeah, an important point. You make that uh, not so much in passing, but you do point out the importance of, of sermons for the historian's task, where it might not be readily understood by people in the present day how significant these sermons were at the time. So in order to uncover and understand the political theology and the, the political um, views of the time, you have to go back and read the sermons that Thankfully, many have been recorded and published to be able to know what what's going on in the minds of these people. And and, and today, I mean, may, you'll find that in some quarters, but in others, you're not going to necessarily look to sermons to find out what people's political views are. Well, the the minister in many contexts uh, was the most educated man sure. in a given community, and 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 the life in the community. Uh, gravitated to or revolved around life in the church so the minister through the sermon has more in had more influence than typically is the case today as you say there are exceptions uh i think perhaps maybe the uh, the minister in a in the black church yeah. community let's think of perhaps. jeremiah wright in the in you know our previous president's administration the the narrative of that and and the role within the community uh, we do see it in certain settings right uh but even then you know it's not probably moderated mm -hmm. as opposed to the way it was in the sure. 18th century where the minister uh Jonathan Edwards, for instance, served at a time where this was changing, at least that's how many historians uh, uh, look at the situation. He was reflecting more the older pattern of the minister being held in high regard. Uh, and the people in Northampton were beginning to change their view to be, be more democratically inclined. That's the, the quick and easy way of describing that. Sure. So sermons, sermon, but even in, in and, and that's why sermons that the Edwards preached were significant because the sermon had a greater influence. We didn't have TV, we didn't have movies, we didn't have recorded music. The the, the play and, and the place where uh, information was disseminated was the pulpit. Bill, it's interesting um, as you turn your attention on page three seventy three of the article, you start to speak about. Uh, John Witherspoon, of course, uh, anyone who's, who knows American Presbyterianism will know about Witherspoon and, and his significance. Uh, although if you 
start to dig down deeper, you might not be such of a hero, <laughs> at least for, for certain, uh, uh, you know, Presbyterian de denominations of the present day, such as the OPC or the, or the PCA. I'm just fascinated by, by the role of, of natural reason within, within politics here and interpretation of the Bible. And uh, I'd love for you to comment a bit on, on Witherspoon and, and, other, and his role, because it seemed as if he had somewhat of a bifurcated view, you know, when he's doing his exegesis or his theology, it's one thing, but then when he comes to his politics, he sets aside certain principles and starts to just operate according to whatever he thinks is, is right. And, 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 and considering Witherspoon and the perception that he had among other people, uh, especially of the time, because that to me really demonstrated the, uh, the tensions inherent that, that we can't think of all this in, in a monolithic way. Sure. Well, uh, you know, you know, Witherspoon uh, was uh, a, a serious thinker, no question. Uh, a deeply influential uh, teacher of Madison at Princeton. Uh, the, uh, you know, on this portion of the paper that you point out, uh, I try to suggest that there's some kind of shift in Witherspoon's thought between uh, being a Scotch minister and being a Scotch minister in America. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what happened, uh, but but <laughs> at least something changed with his ethics. Uh, and uh, one book that uh, uh, addresses this in, in quite a bit of detail is called Republican Theology. It's by a, a, a very good political theorist uh, at Christopher Newport University here in Virginia, uh, where the author discusses uh, the, the influence that Benjamin Rush had on Witherspoon. So Witherspoon was uh, was keen, it seems, on not coming to the United uh, to America, uh, but Benjamin Rush actually traveled to Scotland to try to convince him otherwise, and he succeeded. Uh, and uh, what seems to be significant there is that uh, Rush was very much in, uh, interested in uh, effectively using the Bible as a tool of Republican government to secure virtue and so on. Uh, and so you begin to see some of this uh, in Witherspoon's thought, uh, you know, so, uh, but with respect to uh, some of uh, Witherspoon's uh, influence on the revolution, uh, I quote here, uh, uh, one, one classic article that says that uh, uh, people called Princeton Witherspoon Seminary of Sedition. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Seminary <laughs> of Sedition. Yeah, so it has a good. I think Witherspoon may have been kind of proud of that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's in here. But you know, another one of the famous quotes from uh, Witherspoon himself about the question of revolution was that he was asked whether uh, he thought America was ready for revolution, um, uh, and he said that his view was that America is not only ripe for independence but rotten for the want of it, and so he's very much you know. Uh, advocating for action here. Now, um, uh, part of the point uh, that I try to make here is that, uh, as you suggest, at least on some questions, uh, Witherspoon is a little bit more prepared on various ethical questions uh, to use uh, some sort of independent reason, arguably, uh, according to some, arguably uh, more than he should. Uh, to, to understand what we should be doing in, in terms of uh, human nature. Do we look to ultimately to our humanity as a guide for ethics, uh, or do we have to check that looking to humanity at least uh, against certain, certain principles uh, that we find in the scriptures? Uh, uh, you know, I, I try to suggest the same thing also. Uh, I feel like I'm going to make, make sure people aren't my friends. If, uh, they <laughs> want to, I try to suggest the same thing about Rutherford as well uh, earlier. So uh, in Lex Rex, uh, uh, this is a uh, you know this is a book that was not terribly influential directly on the American Revolution, but was uh, uh, people were aware of it uh, at least. And so uh, you know Rutherford was was clearly uh, a little bit more influenced by a variety of the, the neo the later neo Thomists uh, and had some of their flavor uh, a little bit more than Thomas, for example. And so uh, a lot of the the uh, the Spanish neo Thomists uh, uh, Vasquez uh, and others uh, these would be people who uh, very much were operating with uh, you know a very robust sense of, of reason vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, 
sacred scripture. So, hmm. um, so do you suspect, Bill, that, that uh, with someone like um, John Witherspoon and perhaps Samuel Rutherford, and uh, there's there's a disconnect between, say, they when when they do their handling of Romans 13, they sound like the or at least Witherspoon seems to side with Calvin that there is a there is a, a limited idea of resistance to tyranny by means of the lesser magistrate but then when you look at how he uh, does Witherspoon come out and make a similar argument to Locke and Hoadley uh, elsewhere on Romans 13 or does he never actually refer back to, to Romans 13 as far as you know uh, I'm not sure about Romans 13. I would say that with respect to his uh, his view of a right to revolution, uh, it seems to be pretty clearly Lockean in, in his lectures on moral philosophy okay. that are recorded for us. Right. So, uh, you know, as I suggest in the paper, Witherspoon seems to have, to some degree, thrown things up against the wall. Uh, you know, right. let's get the lesser magistrates argument in there, but we also have this natural rights argument that. Uh, you know, government exists to protect these rights. If it doesn't, uh, then the people have have redress. So, I mean, just to, to perhaps recap, uh, you know, the thesis to this point, maybe before it turned into implications for broader study, as you as you include here toward the end of the article, there are those who would you know would just think the American Revolution was based on Locke's views, and the, and then others that would see them as Lockean and reformed. And that these are compatible with one another. You're suggesting and 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 arguing for the case that there's another strand here, an, an Anglo strand of resistance theory at work. Um, so I'm 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 curious then to think that to to ask you then what are some of the implications for this? I'm on page 385. You write, if the lock-in reformed view is correct, then a significant part of early American political thought namely the intellectual pedigree of the American Revolution is not only consistent with, but perhaps even indebted to an orthodox understanding of Christianity, rather than to, at best, a rationalistic and enlightenment-modified Christianity. Now, there, that might really upset certain people. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear your, your take on that and maybe, you know, draw some threads for us to, to think about things even from a contemporary standpoint. Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, one one author that I cite here uh, in that same paragraph is is Daniel Dreisbach, a very fine scholar who uh, uh, you know disagrees with this. And so, uh, one of the things that Dreisbach does in his work, his various books, that I think is is quite helpful, is that he shows very clearly that the idea that America of this time was a secular or unchurched society is rather absurd. Uh, these you know people mentioned passages from Jeremiah with no citation, and they didn't need to provide a citation because people would know. Yeah, people this is knew from it. Jeremiah. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this does not necessarily require, uh, as I argue, uh, that a lot of these ideas were, were consistent. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. And so uh, one of the things that I, I suggest on the same page is uh, that there's at least some question of whether um, a right for private individuals to start a revolution is plausibly consistent with uh, the rules of biblical interpretation that we see, for example, in chapter one of the Westminster Confession. Uh, uh, if we really interpret scripture with scripture, you have to do uh, you have to do some some hermeneutical uh, Press the digitation uh, in order to arrive there. So, uh, uh, at least that is my view. And so, uh, now uh, I didn't mention yet, but I, I just want to say that you know, one, what does this look like in practice? Uh, to be honest, I don't remember if I mentioned him in the article, but uh, but uh, I do. John Zubley uh, is the first first minister of uh, Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah. Uh, this was a person who was uh, uh, ordained in the Swiss, uh, the German Swiss. Reformed Church uh, came to the United States, uh, was ordained in the Presbyterian Church, and uh, he was a member of the Continental Congress. Uh, his writings, uh, his helvetius, excuse me, uh, some of his earlier essays 
were deeply critical of the actions of Parliament. Uh, he was a uh, he was an absolute. A uh, careful legal mind who is looking out for unconstitutional actions by the Brit British government. So he's invited to the Continental Congress, can't sign the Declaration of Independence. So they took his land and they took his property, and that was the end of the story. And so, you know, here's a person who was absolutely convinced that we should passionately be on the lookout for infringements on our liberty, while at the same time being very suspicious of the idea that uh, people have a private right to resist government. He was also very cautious about the, the prudential implications of, uh, of, of any kind of uh, rebellion, he would call it. Uh, very concerned about what that would turn into. And so it seems to me that that is some of the practical implications. You know, what does this look like uh, for someone who we would say belongs in this continental tradition, as I call it? Uh, in the 18th century, I, was, I would say it looks like John Zubley. So, um, uh, I'm not sure if you can hear that. There's a very loud and annoying part <laughs> singing right there. So. He's having his own civil disobedience. Uh, That's right. He's tired of hearing me. <laughs> so. Oh um, man. So, so the what what you're, I think what you're saying, Bill, is that is that uh, as we look at the issue uh, of of civil disobedience or obe you know, the submission to tyrants in the the Paul's comments in Romans 13 in the American context have not been for the most part properly handled so how do we account for that well the influence of Locke and then of others you know uh, yeah. and you have to I have to ask the question what was in the air or, or we might say, what Kool-Aid were they drinking that made it possible for them to think that this was consistent? For you know, John John Witherspoon being the obvious example of one who, when he's in Scotland, is known as an advocate of the Evangelical or Orthodox party of the yeah. Church of Scotland. Right? He comes to the United States now. He still is theologically, but then he seems to split off this element of, of, uh, well, we, I don't know, natural theology or right. natural philosophy. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would be curious, I have his work, so, which I haven't read all the way through yet, but I'll be curious in my own personal reading to see how, if at all, he handles this, this question of, of, and it, it just reminds me and causes me to ask, where are my blind spots, right? Sure. You no, know, this is a this is does appear to be a rather obvious uh, blind spot that complicates our appreciation for the American Revolution, right? It, it, as Reformed Christians who are who want to be submissive to God's word and not to be exercising uh, autonomous or independent reason. Uh, yeah. then, then uh, we're going to have to be, we're going to have to look at the American Revolution in a nuanced fashion, not necessarily saying it was all bad, but recognizing that it is a mixed bag in terms of the sources or the influence. And then, of course, the other, the other, the other matter is, okay, this is what we have today. If we're starting now as American Christians, this this is the form of government that that if Paul is if, if what Paul says in Romans 13 is true and I believe it is then then our government is is our our ministers to do us good yeah so yeah and so you know and you don't deal with these but the questions that will would follow would be okay uh, given all of this history. Uh, and we're now sensitized to be careful when we look at his, you know, the American Revolution. It's 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 not all bad. It's not all good. So we've we've got to deal with that, you know, sorting and sifting out. But then we have to ask the question, which I'm sure somebody is already thinking. Okay, what does it mean for us now? And I think at the end of the day, it's you, you. We have to. We go with some notion of a lesser magistrate 
uh, response to a, a tyrannical form of government, right? Which would mean something like a governor or, or a secretary of state, that kind of thing. Uh, and I and I would imagine that we have the freedom in you know I don't think it's unbiblical to say that we could write to our congressman and express our views, and right. I think our friend the Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah, that's in a sense what he was doing. He wasn't blind right. to to the to what he considered to be the uh, inappropriate actions of Parliament but he couldn't take the one step farther or, or more than one step farther. Right. Right. He, he said, you know, it's a, it's yes, I'm watching what, what's going on here, but I can't go the, the whole way. So in, as far as you under, understand it, is he, cons would he be considered a royalist in, in by, in our day? I mean, by our lights, or is he not even that? So he's not at a, an American patriot like, you know, uh, uh, John Adams or Thomas <clears throat> Jefferson, but he's he's not a royalist, strictly speaking. Or no, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I want to be cautious. Uh, I don't want to say for certain, but I, I think it would be misleading to say that he'd be a royalist. He's very much, um, uh, one of the things that you see is that he tries to defend the principles of the glorious revolution, like right? a straight check upon right. the monarchy. That, that's the bringing in of William and Mary, right? Uh, uh, that's you know, right. That's right. The and crown. so... Uh, you know, uh, it very well may have looked by, uh, you know, the news coverage that what was happening was a popular rebellion, uh, but, uh, you know, it was very careful uh, uh, by people of the day to argue, no, actually, this is not. And so this is uh, very much a public action. So, uh, you know, Zubli, I think, is a, a really fascinating example uh, in this respect. Uh, I think he's also, you know, he's a he's a warning for folks who would who would not be. Uh, on the lookout for uh, for infringements upon liberty. Right. Uh, so. so he would be a good, he, he might be, I don't know if so, if you're thinking of uh, encouraging research, uh, I, I don't know what, how much has been done on him. He might be, he would be a worthwhile topic for a dissertation uh, and, and books, articles. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I'm not aware of any recent intellectual biography. Uh, the it's one one published compilation of his writing from the 80s. Um, I'm sure you know, there's a lot of his stuff you can find online. Uh, but his most famous writing would be uh, uh, Helbaceous Essays, wrote under mm -hmm. a pseudonym, uh, critiquing the revolution after it got underway. Um, uh, Interesting. You know, I'm not as familiar with his theology, but another example uh, of a similar kind of guy would be Jacob Duche, who is actually the chaplain of the Continental Congress, and then uh, uh, was under conviction of conscience that he, he couldn't support the cause and, and wrote a letter to Washington asking him to change his mind. Uh, and, and Washington turned the letter in uh, to the Continental Congress. And so, uh, but, you know, there were a, f a few of these kind of people who were uh, very influential, uh, very much on guard against uh, uh, inappropriate actions of Britain, uh, but nevertheless couldn't pull the trigger, so to speak, on on revolution. Another person whose political thought I'm not uh, by no means an expert on, but uh, you see some parallels between someone like a Zubli on the one hand and John Dickinson on the other. Oh, yes, right, and here in Pennsylvania. That's right. So, uh, you know, Dickinson was a great, uh, you know, uh, prior to 1776, you might call him a great patriot, right? A great lover of freedom, a great lover of his country, uh, and and eventually became rather lukewarm on the question of whether there was a right or whether it was wise uh, to move ahead with a revolution. Uh, so he, he became less influential at that point. Right. Dickinson College in, in Carlisle is named in his honor, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, he was a member of Continental Congress. I don't remember if he was there the whole time or if he withdrew at some point. But yes, he would be another example of someone. So they would be helpful if, if we think of history as something that helps us. To, you know, we can see how others have wrestled with these questions in the past. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're perfect. It doesn't mean we're obligated to follow them. But it, it helps us to not have to reinvent the wheel. And so your your article, I think, opens up a lot of avenues 
uh, for us as American Christians. Sure. But he, I yeah. mean, this is this is not, of course, something unique to America. <laughs> the idea yeah. of revolution. There, are many countries have gone through that, and so there are Christians in all parts of the world who who have to, at some point or another, as you pointed out, the pastor of Latter Rain Church in China uh, went through some of this. Uh, or is going through, I should say, some of this, this present tense, present and yeah. tense. Uh, and so this is an, uh, this is a perennial issue. It's not, it's right. not, uh, you, it's, it's, a, it's absolutely fascinating in my mind, but, but it's also one that, that, that has different shades and colors in different parts of the world, but it's generally the same problem. How, how do we as Christians uh, interact with our political leaders? Yes. Yes. Right. I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Yeah. You know, for folks who are interested in more more recent reading, uh, if I were just to to mention two competing books uh, debating this broad question, uh, you know, one would be on the one hand, uh, a book that I've already mentioned or alluded to rather uh, by by Professor Daniel Dreisbach, uh, reading the Bible with the American founders, uh, which is, uh, I think, very good. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, there's uh, uh, someone who uh, probably is a little bit more similar to the take that I've given here is uh, uh, Greg Fraser uh, at the Masters University in California. Uh, his book, uh, The Religious Beliefs of America's Founders, uh, is, uh, in my view, uh, an excellent book. Uh, and he's also written a recent book on the, the political thought of the loyalists of the revolution. And so that might be uh, something of interest to some people as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I have those two books in my library. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's it's fitting. Yeah, even the the bibliography is very useful here uh, yes. for people. But I mean, my my take home, uh, you know, it's important for us, of course, to to study history, and even especially the the history of the country where, where you are a citizen, and to understand its government. Uh, but uh, history, just the, the fact that something happened, doesn't necessarily make it normative. And even many people right. that we admire and look back to and, and learn lessons from, we may find that uh, even the best of them may be rather inconsistent on matters. So we're always driven to uh, have a, a consistent uh, and faithful, obedient hermeneutic. And uh, sometimes our our, uh, our American heroes, or they're heroes in the eyes of some and maybe not in the eyes of others, uh, maybe did not espouse such a, an important or, or a consistent hermeneutic. So this has been a tremendous uh, article. Again, the title of it, The American Revolution, Romans 13, and the Anglo Tradition of Reformed Protestant Resistance Theory has been useful and, and certainly opened my eyes to several different threads of the American Revolution, and I think uh, will only stoke uh, some interest uh, for further investigation. So thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today, Bill. It's been enlightening, yeah, and I want to encourage you. Mm. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You bet. And we'll have to f follow up uh, at some point in time, but uh, I'll include a link to the article as well as uh, some of the other resources that we mentioned. And of course, you can uh, find out more information about uh, Regent University online at Regent. Edu. They're in Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia. Lots of programs going on there, even all the way from uh, bachelor's uh, degrees, uh, undergraduate degrees, all the way up to uh, graduate programs and PhD programs. Uh, so there, there, there's a lot at the university for you to take a look at. And uh, there and you can find uh, Dr. Redinger's uh, page as well and find out the courses he's taught and other publications that, uh, that he also has produced. So we're online at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about all of our programs and courses, other things that we're up to. And uh, we do want to encourage you to get in touch with us if you have any comments or feedback or suggestions. But I do want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.